Well, good morning, friends. Hey, Brother Mike, back on the podcast. It's Sunday morning at nine o'clock Mountain Time. Trusting you're ready to go to uh, receive from the Spirit of the Living God. Got a good Bible study for you this morning. Uh, remember that um, if you need to get in contact with me, you can do that by sending me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. You can watch all my teachings including this one on our teaching channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Okay? All, you'll find all of my teachings on, uh, on the YouTube channel. There's like 400 of them. And uh, if you happen to be in the Phoenix area, please uh, come for a visit. We're downtown on 15th Avenue. We're just south of Osborne Road. It's the Red Brick Building. And if you happen to be on Facebook, you can go to Michael W. Smith, or you can go to the fa our Facebook group, Hardcore Christianity. And if you'd like to read about all the miracles that have happened in the ministry, uh, I list them on my Facebook page, the group called Blessings. If you go to Blessings, you'll see a picture of the Arizona Deliverance Center. And just scroll down there and see all the utterly remarkable things that have happened people getting healed, people being delivered from demons. Literally, it's all right there on the blessing page. Some of them are pictures, some of them are videos. Anyway, it's an opportunity for you to be encouraged, which is what I'm going to do today. Try to uh, encourage you. If you have your Bibles there, turn with me to the great gospel of John. Uh, John, as you know, is different from the other three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, John is uh, the most amazing of the four Gospels and is the, is the greatest collection of writings in the history of the world. The Gospel of John is at the top. And then you have the three Gospels here, and then you have the book of Acts. And those are the books that allowed us to get saved 2,000 years later. Totally amazing. Check this out. John chapter 5, uh, verse 1, says there, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now at Jerusalem, by the uh, sheep market, there was a pool there. Now uh, in the Greek, that was kind of mistranslated. Uh, Probaticus was the Greek word that meant sheep gate. There was a special gate or an area in Jerusalem where all the livestock was brought in. And this pool was very close to the entrance for the livestock for the city. So if you were selling livestock in Jerusalem during the feast or during some other holiday, <clears throat> you would go in through that back gate into the city of Jerusalem. There was a special gate for animals. And so uh, it's called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, Bethesda. In, in, in uh, Hebrew, it means the house of kindness. And this pool had five porches, and the remains of this pool are uh, in Jerusalem to this day. You can uh, see pictures of it on Google if you like. But it says, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. Obviously, that's the Greek word, astheno, which means people who, who couldn't walk, could not. They were, they had ambulation problems. They also, some of them were blind. And then some of them were halt, it says. Uh, kolos is the Greek word for somebody who's limps, limping. Uh, it also says there's, there were people there withering. <clears throat> That's uh, uh, exerus, which means atrophy. Their bodies had atrophied through lack of use. And they laid there waiting for the moving of the water. This is one of the strangest uh, stories in all of the Bible. Really unusual. It says, for an angel went down at a certain season, a season nobody knew. And the angel went into the pool 
And he troubled the water, it says. Terrasso means to agitate or stir. And uh, whoever first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made completely whole of their uh, disability. Or this, the Greek word here is uh, nosima. Nosima means a disease. Some of the people there were paralyzed or disabled from diseases. And it says a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years. Can you imagine that? That's amazing. That's a long, long, long time to pray to God to be healed. And uh, in our society today, uh, obviously, 99.9% .9 of the Christians would have given up. This guy did not give up. And he was there looking for a miracle from God. He had demonstrated his perseverance, and he was still believing. And it says, verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he had been there a long time. That's the Greek word, gnosko. It means uh, he understood somehow that the guy had been there for 38 years or thereabouts. And Jesus asking the weirdest question you've ever heard, very strange. Will you be made whole? That's the Greek word, phalo. It means, do you want to? Do you want to be made whole? Now, that appears to be a extremely stupid question. It appears to have no logic and no sense, but actually, that's a very revealing question. Um, what I was, what I'm about to share with you is going to sound like I'm crazy, okay? but some people who are sick or disabled don't want to be healed, and they won't fight for their healing. They won't believe for it. Why is that? Well, somebody's getting some kind of benefit out of a disability or a sickness or something. It could be uh, Social Security disability benefits. It could be workers' comp. It could be uh, sympathy. It could be attention. You never know what is going on in somebody's, somebody's mind. And as a counselor, that's the first thing I look at. What is this person thinking? That's the first thing I look at. And here you see, you, you can see that God literally is exploring what's in the guy's mind. Because on the surface of it, it appeared, of course he wants to be healed. He's laying there by the pool. And Jesus is asking, do you want to be healed? You know, what's that revealing to us? Well, there were some people at the pool of Bethesda that were there for other reasons. Maybe they had developed a friendship or two at the pool. Maybe it was a um, gigantic daily pity party. Uh, maybe it was a frustration venting group. You never know what is going to happen. You never know what people are thinking. You'd be surprised at what people are thinking. Uh, those of you who are married know what I'm talking about. And it says, verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, Sir, Greek word kurios, which means Lord. It's usually translated as Lord. Lord, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. While I'm coming, Hey, somebody else steps out ahead of me and gets in the water. Okay, there's your answer. Jesus got his answer. He knows the guy has faith now. He knows that the guy wants to be healed. 
He knows he's not there for any other ulterior reason or motive. And then Jesus says to him, quote, rise. That's the Greek word, word uh, agairo, means to stand up. Stand up, take up your bed. Take up, iro is the Greek word, means to pick up and get rid of. Move this bed out of here because somebody else may need to use this area. Move, get rid of your bed. You don't need it anymore. Okay. Last year, and this uh, story and the picture of it is on my uh, Facebook group, Blessings. I had gone to a, um, a revival that another ministry was having um, in Phoenix. And uh, it was at a place called Castles and Coasters. And uh, that's a, it's a giant amusement park at a, uh, near, a, a near a mall that's kind of closed down now, Metro Center Mall. And uh, I got there at the end of the revival on the last day. And uh, while I was sitting there listening to the Christian group sing, I looked over and saw a woman in her wheelchair. So I got up and went over to talk to this woman. She was with her husband. And uh, she uh, had been, looked like she had been uh, in the wheelchair for a long time. She had gained a lot of weight. She looked like she was, you know, 40 pounds overweight. So I started to talk to her and I realized that she had been, she had rejection demons and she had been rejected and uh, dismissed by numerous people, particularly her parents. She told me a little bit about her background. And I said to her, uh, do you want to be healed? Would you like to be healed? She said, yeah, I, I want to be healed. I said, well, what we're going to have to do here is forgive all those people. And we can do that right now. And uh, God will honor your prayer. And we can pray for them, just like the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who despitefully use you. She agreed. And so I led her, led her through a uh, repentance prayer. We got all of these abusers covered. Uh, her her uh, first husband was physically abusive, used to beat her. Her mother was very critical and negative toward her. Uh, she, you know, she had, had had a tough life. So then I said, well, uh, let's go ahead and stand up now. And so I reached down and grabbed her hands and I just kind of pulled her out of the wheelchair and she stood up and she was wobbly. And I said, that's okay. Keep standing. Come on, stand up. Okay. Now go ahead and walk, walk, walk over there. And her husband was to her left and she started walking and was utterly amazed. And uh, she was crying. And uh, I got a picture of her and her husband hugging each other after she was healed. I put it on that Facebook group, Blessings. And about 20-something uh, minutes later, I was praying with somebody else. And I looked up and I saw that this woman had sat back down in that wheelchair. I ran over there and grabbed her and told her to never sit in that chair again. And uh, she is to push the chair home, not sit in the chair. Because I didn't want her to lose her healing. And I kind of panicked when I saw that. And uh, fortunately, she listened to me. And she was healed. <clears throat> you can read the story on the, on the Facebook group. And Jesus said, stand up, pick up your bed, get rid of it, and walk. And the Greek word there, peripateo, means to walk around, walk all over the place, just walk around. And he did. It says immediately the man was made whole, and then he, Iro, picked up his bed, and he walked all around. And unfortunately, 
uh, for Jesus, this occurred on the Sabbath day. Sabaton is the Greek word for Sabbath. Now, the Jews had all kinds of Sabbaths, several of them, during the year. We don't know which one this one was, but we do, do know it was some, some kind of Sabbath. And verse 10 says, the Jews therefore said to the man that was cured, hey, it is the Sabbaton. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them and said, <laughs> he answered them, he said, he that made me whole told me to pick up and get rid of my bed. So I'm, I'm carrying it out of here. And then he told me to walk. And then they asked him, what man is that that told you that? Who told you to take up your bed and walk? Okay. And the guy said, I don't know who it is. Because after the healing, Jesus had moved out of the area for obvious reasons. Had he, had he started healing the people at the pool of Bethesda, there would have been absolute bedlam in the, in, in the uh, area where people would be, I mean, it would have drawn a crowd and um, it would have been uncontrollable. A mob would have manufactured had he started healing everybody laying around the pool of Bethesda. There must have been dozens and dozens of bodies laying there. Here you can see uh, the horrible disease of religion. And here you can see why religion is so satanic. It places religious dogma above the love for the person. It places religious theories above the welfare of humans. The religion is more important than the benefits to humanity. It happened one day when Jesus was in a synagogue, he saw a man that had a withered hand. He was totally disabled, and obviously with one hand, you, you couldn't work because most jobs back then were manual labor. And he looked around, the Bible says he looked around the synagogue after he said, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to help people and care for people? Well, no, in religion, it's not lawful. You're not allowed to do that with the satanic power of religion. You have to conform to the rules. And Jesus looked around with anger, it says in the Greek. He was, he was upset at the attitude of the people toward that disabled man with a withered hand. It bothered him that nobody cared that this guy was totally disabled, living in poverty, could not work, and had been suffering for years. That really bothers your Heavenly Father. He doesn't like that. And you know the story. The guy, he said, stretch forth your hand. There it is. Boom. And he was instantly healed. And then it says, they were filled with madness. <clears throat> Can you believe that? That is the supernatural power of religion. It is, it is murderous. Many wars have been started because of religion. Religious is Satan's trump card uh, on humanity. And religion will be Satan's supernatural power demonstrated in the Antichrist and the false prophet just a few years from now. The tribulation is only a few years away now. Verse 13, Jesus had <clears throat> hid himself away. But later on, it says here, Jesus found him. Now that Greek word for find there is really interesting. It's heurisko, which means he was looking for him. Jesus was looking for the man who had been healed. He was walking around the temple trying to find the guy. When he found him, he says these words, which is absolutely remarkable. He says, quote, you behold, you have been made whole. Sin no more. 
lest a worse thing come upon you. Wow, that seems to be indicating, it doesn't say it but directly, but it seems to be indicating that sin or some kind of sin had caused that man's disability. He had been sinning, and Jesus wanted to warn him, again, out of love. That's why your Heavenly Father tells you, you know, you've got to watch your life. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to become sanctified, is the term. Hagiadzo means to be sanctified in the Greek. It means to be set apart for God. That's what God's calling you today to do today uh, at the end of the first month of 2023. He's calling you to become sanctified, to set your life apart for God. Can you imagine a worse thing than being disabled for 38 years? Man, that's crazy. What's worse than that? I don't even want to think about it. And then, unbelievably, the man departs and goes back to the Jews. Now, he had to have known that the religious Jews in the temple were angry at Jesus because they were angry at the disabled man because he was carrying his mattress around. Imagine that. He must have known something was negative. He couldn't have been a, a complete neophyte. He goes bats, back and rats Jesus out. He rats him out. That is utterly amazing. You would have thought the guy would have been absolutely consumed with gratefulness and would have been so thankful that he would have stood up for Jesus every step of the way. And then the Lord comes to him and gives him a warning so that he can maintain his healing. Okay? I've been a counselor for over 40 years. I have seen so many people lose their healing. You wouldn't believe how many drug addicts, alcoholics, you wouldn't believe how many people, you know, healed of arthritis or fibromyalgia, lose their healings. You would not believe it. Why? They started sinning again. Rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, those diseases are all promoted, caused by soul wounds, wounds in the soul taking offenses, bitterness, unforgiveness, alcoholics, drug addicts. Many of them lose their healings because they go back to drinking. They go back to self-pity. They go back to self-disgust. They go back to criticizing others. Religion has got to be the biggest plague the devil ever poured on humanity. And here you can see it in living color. This guy goes from being healed for 38 years disabled and Jesus warning him, helping him again so he can retain his healing. Because if you go back into sin, that's going to affect your faith. It's going to, it's going to affect your level of doubt. People can lose their faith. People can lose through doubt. And sometimes they can lose their healing. So Jesus was saying, go and sin no more. What kind of sin it was, only they knew. He didn't reveal it here. But it was him trying to help the guy. First he healed the guy. Then now he's trying to help the guy. Keep his healing. And it says in verse 16, the Jews then started to persecute Jesus. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath, he had, he had broken the laws of religion. Another reason Jesus was doing it on the Sabbath, of course, was to demonstrate to us in living color the transition from 
Old Testament law, the Old Testament contract, the Old Testament covenant, to the New Testament covenant. In the New Testament covenant, covenant, the, the Sabbath, and all the other laws, rules, and regulations no longer apply. You are no longer required as a born again Christian under the new covenant to, you know, keep festivals and feasts and holy days and new moons. None of that stuff is required anymore. Uh, is it a sin for you to do it? Uh, no, but it's not required. As long as you understand you're just doing it for other reasons other than the fact that you're required to do it, you'll be fine. Stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stay free. Stay healed. Okay? God wants you well. He wants to heal you. He wants to take care of you. Now, is all sin, is, 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 are all sicknesses and disabilities caused by sin? Of course they're not. Of course not. Uh, sometimes they're just outright attacks. Sometimes they're the result of witchcraft. Sometimes they're the result of bad genetics. Um, sometimes people are born with disabilities. You know, that happened in uh, John chapter 9. You know, um, Jesus ran into a guy who was blind from birth. And the master said, who sinned that caused this kid to be blind? The man or his parents, okay? And uh, back in the day, back in that time, anything bad that happened to the person in religion, everybody saw it as they did some kind of sin that caused it. They didn't understand the spirit world and didn't understand that demons carry sin, sickness, and disease with them, and they impart those things into the body of a human. And they didn't understand spiritual warfare, mainly because they had, did not understand and did not take to heart the great book of Job. In that book, God revealed that Satan has the power to do things most people do not think he can do. Uh, control the weather. Um, implant sicknesses on people's bodies. Uh, murder family members. Destroy businesses. All these things Job faced. And he didn't know it was Satan behind the curtain causing all these problems. It couldn't be any clearer. Read the first and second chapter of Job today. It's just two chapters. And you will find uh, 21st century Christianity in those two books. Christians today are as ignorant about the devil as Job was. Without a doubt. Job did not understand that God was not causing all those problems. Job said he was. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But it wasn't true because he couldn't see behind the curtain, the veil. But God used that person, the great prophet Job, and he used that incident to, to show us and train us to see clearly that behind the curtain of your life, there is a spiritual war going on on the other side of the veil. I can't see that veil right now because I live in the natural world. But if you were to die, if I was to die right now, my inner man, of course, would leave my body and I could see into the spirit realm better than I can see in the natural world. In the spirit realm, you don't even need to talk to anybody. Your thoughts transmit to the other spirit being. When you're in the spirit realm, you're not talking to angels like I'm talking to you. You're talking 
in your mind. They can hear you. You can hear them. Communication in the spirit world is spiritual. Communication in the natural world is natural. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. I did my teaching on uh, monthly teaching on deliverance training yesterday. I would urge you to uh, take a look at that teaching. I went into a lot of key areas of human intelligence and the mind of human beings in that teaching. Uh, it should be up on the YouTube channel today, but the teaching was yesterday. And it was very interesting. Everybody was very interested in the teaching. It was a uh, refreshing revelation into the mind of man and how the devil handles people of different intelligent levels. I went through the whole thing and went through the testing instruments used to d discover what kind of an IQ, what kind of intelligence a human being has. But the spirit realm is more real than the natural world. The problem with you and I is we can't see it. And most human beings, unfortunately, if, if it's not involving their five senses, they don't, they don't really focus on it. They don't, they don't believe it. And that's what Jesus was saying to the disabled man. Listen, there's a spirit world out there. And if you keep living in sin, you could end up disabled again. You could end up on another mattress. You could end up back at the pool. Now, you would have thought that Christians would be as thrilled as they could be with me, Brother Mike. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you would have thought, wow, hey, this, this guy's really wonderful. No, that is not what happens. I preach and teach a form of the gospel that is uh, extremely blunt because I don't have time to, the old slang saying, pussyfoot around with the word of God. I just teach it bang right in your face. And you would have thought people would be rejoicing over that, but no, they do not rejoice over it. They <laughs> send me emails and stuff. They get offended at me and so on. In fact, it happened yesterday. I was counseling a father and a son who had traveled to the deliverance center from out of state after my uh, deliverance training class. And the, 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 the dad got mad at me and took offenses at what I was saying. He had uh, enormous bitterness and disgust for his wife. And I tried to explain to him every which way but loose that there wasn't any way for him to be delivered from demons because he had to forgive his wife first. And he went into a long diatribe about all these bad things his wife had done. She did this, she did this. I mean, it went on for like four or five minutes. And I said, look, that's got nothing to do with you. If you want to get healed, you have to forgive her. And that's it. That, that's the end of it. You want to die? You want to die with demons? You want to die in misery? You want your family to go down in flames? Yes or no? The guy would not listen to me. Got mad, left in a huff, you know. But that's how it works. This guy got a warning from Jesus how to keep his healing and immediately went to Jesus' enemies. He knew they didn't like him. He knew he, he may not have known they wanted to kill him, but they knew that that they were critical of him. Right out of the gate, he had healed on the Sabbath. So right there, the guy knew, hey, these people don't like this guy that healed me. And as soon as he found out who he was, he rats on him. Well, that's weird. I wouldn't have done that. Oops, time out. Yes, you would have. That's typical for a Christian in the 21st century, okay? Because 99% of all Christians are carnal Christians, 
which means they live out of their soul. And your soul is the seat of your emotions. And people who live out of their emotions, like the man at the pool of Bethesda, always, always end up a loser. If the devil can get you to live out of your soul and live by your emotions, you're dead in the water. Dead. You got to repent of it. You got to change. Now, yesterday, that poor family, that dad that came to visit me, would not listen, would not change. The guy at the pool of Bethesda, my guess is, ended up sick again. After he ratted on Jesus, my guess is, I don't know that for sure, that he ended up disabled again. You, friend? No. You're not going to be that way. Not in 2023. You might have been that way in 2022. Not this year. You're not going to lose this year. This isn't, It isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. If you know somebody needs to be healed, I just finished a three-part series on the unusual oddities and mysteries of divine healing. It's on the YouTube teaching channel. Healing part one, part two, part three. Tremendously informative teaching, unlike any teaching on healing you've ever seen before. I looked at the pros and the cons, the ups and the downs of divine healing and outline the whole thing for you in those those three teachings. Quite remarkable. At the end of all three of the teachings, of course, we had an altar call where people, some people were healed and dozens were delivered from demons. You can see it right on the video tape. I leave my mic on so you can hear the conversations of what's going on. You can notice what I'm doing and saying. If I make a mistake, you can see it so you won't repeat it. If I say something productive, you can hear it and repeat it so it will go better. It's an interesting learning experience watching people get healed and delivered in real time. Very unusual. But today, you are going to learn through this beautiful story that you've been praying a long time for something. And the devil has beaten you over the head with a real bat, not a Nerf bat, a real one telling you, give up, quit, don't keep believing. That's what he's telling you. You're facing a total disaster in your life. And uh, you and I are the same. I'm just an ordinary person. I have had so much adversity and so many disasters that I've faced over the years. I'm not even going to recount it. Okay, But I will close with this. I, I told you this a few podcasts back. As you might remember, if you heard the podcast, when I was a teenager, I went to a Catherine Kuhlman service in Tulsa, Oklahoma at ORU at the Maybe Center uh, on campus there. That was the basketball auditorium. And uh, if you want to hear the whole story about what happened that day, go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ and Look up the video, Brother Mike Meets Catherine Kuhlman. And uh, you'll be crying while you're watching it, and you'll be laughing while while you're watching it. I did both while I was telling it. But I actually saw a pool of Bethesda, a situation, and I was a teenager then. I was not following God, and I was utterly flabbergasted. I was flabbergasted. I was sitting on the aisle down at the lower level, about, oh, it seems like 20 rows, 25 rows. I had gotten there two hours early, and I ran like Carl Lewis to get down to the front to save. I needed four seats, five seats, needed five seats. Well, I took the seat on the aisle, and I saved the other four for the people I went there with. And at the prayer time, at the end of the service, um, Catherine Coleman came out and said a very short prayer. Um, 
I found the woman very strange. She was the strangest looking uh, minister I had ever seen in my life. Of course, I was only 19 at the time. How much had I seen? But I was hoping that all ministers didn't look like her. I mean, she looked really bad. And while she was praying, way back in the back, on my right, up the aisle, I was on the aisle seat, up the aisle, way back in the back, I heard a bunch of noise and moaning and crying going on. And then I heard crying and moaning going on all over the maybe center. There was 16,000 people there, 16,000 people. The basketball floor, had all they had folding chairs. That's where we were. I mean, the place was literally packed. There were no seats left, none completely full. I turned around on the aisle seat and looked back down the aisle. And there was a guy that looked like an Auschwitz victim coming toward me down the aisles, going down to the front to give his testimony. He had pipe cleaners for arms and pencils for legs. He had been in the wheelchair. It looked like most of his life. He had completely withered or atrophied, totally. He, he was totally and completely disabled. It was obvious the guy was a quadriplegic. And while he was walking down the aisle, I looked at his face. I was in a state of shock. He was weeping. There were giant tears coming down his cheeks. And he was walking kind of staggering like that, um, balance a little off. <clears throat> you could tell he had been in a wheelchair for years. I mean, it was, it was a pitiful quadriplegic case. He was healed. His spinal cord had been healed. I could not forget it. And here I am, an old man, decades later, I can remember the incident almost like it was yesterday. Almost like it was yesterday. This guy crawled out of the wheelchair section, which was his pool of Bethesda, and was heading down to the front. Now, what point am I trying to make here? You may be facing challenges and difficulties in your life that have not been fixed, have not been answered, have not smoothed out yet. And the devil's coming to you and he's hitting you hard. He is beating on you. Give up, quit, get impatient, make a bad decision, force the thing yourself, fix it yourself, lose your faith, quit. There is no God. God doesn't care. He's not going to help you. He's not going to be with you. All of it just bombards in. Who gets hit with it? Everybody gets hit with it. I am getting hit with it. Absolutely. I have some things in my life that have still not been answered. Okay? My daughter is still disabled after 26 years. And the devil keeps telling me to give up. And I keep telling him, I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on believing. And you know what? You are too. You're going to keep on believing because God has a miracle in 2023 for you.